Hello everyone. So, I have been asked to talk about this specific book, which is called Six Ways, Approaches and Entries for Practical Magic by someone from the group, uh, the Witchcraft Life group, Calypso. As, let me borrow an electronic copy of this. Borrow an electronic copy of this read into that what you will. I haven't actually read through this book because this isn't, essentially is not really a book review is it, this series. It's called Not a Book Review for a Reason, we don't review books. But I am going to have a little look at it and I'm going to see what little conversations this starts. So there is a introduction, a contents page, contents page looks quite somewhat interesting, it's got things such as the six ways, guts, gut and bone, um, reclaiming self power and position, things, offerings, petitions, sigils, all kind of witchy and magical, talismanic magic, blah blah blah. Second chapter is just called intention, so let's go straight there shall we, page 13, let's find page 13, there we go, chapter 1, introduction, chapter 2, intention. Most forms of magic and sorcery, and really most actions at all, work best with some kind of an intention. So here is mine for this book. Oh, I don't really care about the book. Right, let's go on. Um, if you wish to dive right into the action part of the book, because it is supposed to be a practical book, it says, try this for an entry. Take a piece of paper and a pen and write out what you are reading this book for. Narrow it down to a single clear sentence. Well, actually, immediately a tarot card springs to mind. I'm not so much seeing a sentence, I'm seeing a specific tarot card. That tarot card for me is the judgment card. Obviously, a lot of people seem to get off on me completely slagging off books and the like. I'm giving this one a fair chance. Um, and the reason is that judgment springs to mind is for the simple reason that, well, someone asked me to look at this and asked me what I thought of it. So it's kind of like my opinion, but not an opinion that I can really give as a review fully reading the book cover to cover. I'm just glancing at it. But I'm going to indulge the author here. So, if I get, I got this through the post, right? It's a bunch of sticky label. I'm thinking this is perfect for some of my little books and stuff. I can take little colour-coded bits and I can put it in the different chapters so that I remember where they are. But it does come with a post-it note. So I'm going to indulge this and do this now. So what's it asking me to do? It's asking me to sum up. Um, take a piece of paper and a pen, write out what you, why you are reading this book. Judgment. I've written judgment, okay? I've written judgment on there. Um, this may be rather hard. Well, I didn't find it that hard, but then um, some would call me a super witch, so maybe that's why. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, right. So, take your intention and write it out again on a small square of paper. Three inches by three inches. Right, so I've written it on a piece of paper. He's asking me to get another piece of paper now. Read your intention out loud three times. Right, so I've got to read, write, write it again. Judgment. Have I got to write it three times? i just got to say it three times, haven't I? Read your attention aloud three times, kiss the paper three times, and breathe onto it three times, and say, as it was, as it is, as it shall be. Threes are important, apparently. I agree with that. It gives no clarification as to why three is a magical number or important, but it does say in the footnotes that three is magical. So, got me a piece of paper. I go fold it towards me. I'm going to fold it towards me, right? Um, judgment. 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 <sighs> Don't know if I've got to breathe onto the paper three times, but I'm going to do it just. just 
there we go i've breathed on it three times i've said it three times and i'm also going to say as it was as it is as it shall be as it was as it is as it shall be as it was as it is as it shall be okay now what am i doing uh place the paper in the back of the book i think what i'll do is i'll i'll put it to the back of the screen that's the good thing about a sticky note is that i can stick it to the back of the screen i'm presuming here it's still gonna work you know i'm improvising for the 21st century sorcery is the art of communication with okay so why did i do that did it give me any explanation as to why i did that no so chapter one is a page and a half long and the page looks to be about an a4 a5 page so it doesn't really give me much information as to why i just did that and one might if someone was pessimistic feel like one was wasting their time but anyway maybe it will be at the back uh sorcery is the art of communication with the field and its inhabitants the field is highly responsive to our intentions oh right it's one of them is it both those stated and unspoken. Magic is primarily learning and remembering how to clarify both the known and unknown intentions or desires. If that language works, better for you. Uh, da, da, da. The fillers are how to speak them into the field in a way to increase the possibility, possibility of positive health or response. This is how I approach it. Right, okay, so that I'm. this is chapter two. I haven't read the introduction, but chapter two seems like bs to me so there's this concept that if you want something and you say it out loud that it's going to happen now this author here has put um speak them into the field in a way that increases the possibility of a positive helpful response i'm sorry that ain't good enough right i come from a background in magical practice and witchcraft whereby it is um necessary it is a survivalist craft right i can't be dealing in no uh, yeah it'll increase the odds of it happening a little bit i need to know this is going to happen when it comes to spell casting and stuff like that this is something this is a mistake i see a lot of beginners make and a lot of beginner books sorry a lot of Authors the right beginner books make. You learn so much under pressure. Okay. This reminds me actually of a post I saw the other day in this uh, Facebook group called Brothers of the Craft, which I believe is basically a group for magically inclined people, pagans and witches, but mainly men or people that identify as men, I should say. Um, most of the time it's just BS and memes of warlock looking dudes that kind of say guys can be witches too kind of thing there's not a huge amount in there if i'm honest that i see i don't go in there on a regular basis but whenever i go in there it's the usual meme meme posts and stuff um but there was one person that put this really interesting thing which i'd like to pick up on in terms of what this all first kind of alluding to with the intention and they there was someone in this group that put um how can i increase the odds of winning at a casino right and it was very interesting because i think that's a genuine question a very interesting question i liked the question i didn't respond to it but i liked it um quite literally press that little like button and i like liked it as well um and it's kind of the idea of looking through those comments and some of them were like well don't bother doing it don't bother gambling and other people were kind of like put some lavender uh, put some like bay leaf and crap like that in your shoe or go and get some prosperity oil or something like that and i'm kind of thinking like this is not good this is not the standard of practice i'd expect from like our witchcraft life group or any of the people that we mentor because there's a lot of people saying no go, go don't do it or kind of almost alluding to well magic can't really help you at the casino you know it might increase your odds a little bit but no I, I want kind of like i want to be able to if you're a magical practitioner walk into a casino and walk out with, with a shit ton of money you know if it's magic and magic works you should be able to do that there was a lot of ideas within this post of intention of well you know you can do money magic and the like but because you're going into a casino 
and the greedy people that own the casino really, really, really don't want you to win and you're at a roulette wheel or around a back rent table or, you know, playing Texas Hold'em or something, cards, right? And you're with a bunch of other people that really, really want to win, that that somehow nullifies all of your intention is really difficult. And to me, that's like complete BS, you know? Because from my perspective, and what we talk about in the Thoth Mystery School and such, it's not about the intention. The intention is the first step, the first step of inspiration, the first step of, okay, I actually want to do something. I want a specific outcome. I want to do this. I, you know, I don't want this to happen. This is the, what do I want to change? You know, that is the intention. That isn't really powering, powering anything. That's the spark that says, I'm stuck at the traffic lights. I really wish they would change. Oh, I know I'll do a piece of magic. The intention is I want the traffic lights to change, but your intention, I'm sorry, is not going to make the traffic lights change. Now, some people get a little bit upset with me because I use uh, nasty, rude and upsetting phrases and such, right? One of the phrases that I like to, uh, or examples I like to give for something like this is little Timmy, right? Little Timmy six-year-old kid and he's uh dying in a hospital bed okay and mummy's there rocking backwards and forwards crying going oh little timmy i really want you to get better get better little timmy i'll give anything to make you better because she's crying because her son's dying in the hospital bed right now she fucking intends right for the child to get better the doctor intends for the child to get better a bunch of random family members and friends intent for the child to get better there ain't a huge amount of people if i'm honest apart from maybe the funeral home that are intending for the child to get sick right and die now obviously there's something more than just intention because there's a lot of people that are weeping and crying that really 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 want little timmy to get better and yet little timmy ain't getting better right so there must be something else. There must be some other aspect to this magical spell or something. It is not all about the intention. Now, me and Chris talk about the magical spell casting triangle that we normally teach as a super basic beginner. And it is beginner. Believe me, it gets more advanced as things go on. But it is still a beginner thing. So this whole idea of things being about intention, it just... I don't like it to be repeated constantly in a lot of these new new books um that are coming out clarifying the focus this is chapter three it can be tricky to write on magic and sorcery as there are those with vested interest in viewing them in specific ways i think she's talking about me or he's talking about me um archaeology anthropology mythology occultism blah 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 yeah okay let's get to the good stuff I call my approach er sorcery or dirt sorcery. Er is a prefix meaning blah 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 blah. I okay, can't get to the point. Um, I see it as foundational to our embodied natures. In other words, there is little that is truly necessary to learn. Dirt is of the soil, the land, the stones and bones, the very stuff that in most mythologies, blah 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 blah. Magic lies waiting in our blood and bones, waiting for us to open its presence. This is very true. I'll agree with that, right? The concept of, and we see this with the tryhards and the naturals, which is, again, another thing that people get upset about. The kind of idea that, well, I can just wheel things into existence. I can circuitly see stuff like spirit man. I haven't really had to put much effort into it. And people are kind of like, are you a nut job? Or, okay, you're not a nut job because because you've told me a load of psychic stuff and you've been able to do all these wonderful magical things, but I can do that. How do you do that? I don't really know. I just kind of do it, you know? This idea, the idea that magic lies away in, in our blood and bones. Magic in itself is a birthright of humans. Everyone can do magic, but everyone is different. Everyone taps into that and performs magic differently, much like everyone does a lot of different things differently funnily enough if you ask someone to 
tell a joke. There are certain people that would tell a really unfunny joke. There are certain people that wouldn't necessarily get a joke at all in itself, which would be funny because you're left out the person not being able to tell a joke. Yeah. Some people would tell like really rude jokes, you know, maybe racist, homophobic jokes and stuff like that. Things that we're not supposed to laugh about because it's bad. Um, calling the spirits. All right. Okay. So that's the next section. But yeah, the idea that everyone can do magic. Yes. It's about how you interact with the universe and how you get that out of yourself. And the best tutor for you would probably be your future self that's cracked it. Unfortunately, unless you're a magical practitioner already, that is enabled to talk to and communicate with your future self and have it teach you. Right don't really help with the uh you know people that can not do anything they're really like i've never had a magical experience don't know where to start blah 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 those sorts of people tend to go for the beginner book such as this in which they're normally taught a little bit about fucking intention and uh that which isn't necessarily good that or correspondences are where you get a candle and you put some oil and some herbs on it and apparently that makes something happen calling the spirit so there are a number of practices and concepts that are often considered to be foundational to the practice of magic. Perhaps the first is calling in or calling up the spirits, known as invocation and evocation, respectively. Then the person goes on to talk about what their idea of invocation and evocation is, which we don't really care about, because let's be fair, most people have an idea. Here is an experiment you can try. Oh, I do love an experiment if you'd like to play with these little things. Let's decide to work with something generally useful. Let's also decide that it is the quality of being able to see more available options than is usual. These are forms of magical works, usually called road openers. Okay, so this is some sort of road opening spell or ritual. So this then might be our stated focus, greater awareness of beneficial options available to me now. Right. We can write an evocation, calling up, for it, which might go something like, oh, they're going to give us an option for an evocation. I wonder if Liam's going to like it. <clears throat> I'll use my uh, reading voice, if you like. Here and now, in this place, I call upon the powers of optionality. Optionality? Exclamation mark. Come before me now and let me see your nature. That's too much nature. Put some fucking clothes on. Come before me now and speak to me of possibilities, of outcomes, beneficial to me that I have been unable to see. Right, okay, so it goes on a little bit. Show me the roads open to me, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that's an evocation, a calling up. So we're supposed to be evoking, presumably a spirit, because it's in the spirit chapter, of optionality. Very interesting concept. It also gives an invocation, calling in. Here and now, in this place, I call upon the powers of optionality. Come into me now. Ooh, don't do that. No, I don't want you in me. And let me share in your nature. This is getting very dirty all of a sudden. I'm not going to lie. It's again, come into me now that I may know the possibilities, the outcomes beneficial to me. Hmm. Concepts. Love. Hate. War. Famine. IBS, cancer, all of these are words and concepts and things that have a lot of shit attached to them. Can you evoke, of evoke, so manifest the spirit in front of you, of these things? Is there a spirit attached to them? By spirit, we generally mean, most of the time, some kind of sentient, non-corporeal form. It's talking about a road opener, so opportunity and stuff. I mean, that's not too dissimilar from muses and stuff like that, isn't it? The idea of a spirit or a muse, something that whispers in your ear or gives you inspiration or something like that. But think about anything. Think about love. There are lots of god gods and goddesses associated with things like war and love and such like that. You 
you know, they're gods, goddesses, so you should be able to summon them up, invoke them or evoke them or communicate with them or bring them into the room and such. A lot of people go for those because they're stereotypical. But how many people have actually tried to evoke, summon up into the room, into a physical manifestation of some kind, a health condition? What would cancer look like, like look like if you were to summon it into the room? Because technically, it's a thing, isn't it? It has a word. I'll leave you with that. You can ponder that one. Uh, I'm not really happy with this evocation. Oh, right. Now we're on to chapter four, which is animism. Love a bit of animism. And I'm not going to read that one just for the simple reason that animism, you all probably know that what that is. The, ba the best thing that I can give in terms of advice for people that don't know what the animism is, is... Everything's alive. Hmm, interesting. I think it's a really good one to really ponder and open up because the idea with animism is that all things have a spirit in that. And we could think very mercurially, analytically, and think, well, if it's physical, then it also must exist as above, so below in the etheric realm. If it exists in the etheric realm, it therefore must have spirit. So the soul and spirit is up in there. In the spirit realm and the physical bit is down here if it's a rock or a, a really crap phone case maybe it's man-made maybe it's not natural but it is physical and therefore it must be in the physical world as above so below some energetic component of that up there right interesting yeah some people will just go as far as that with animism what i like to do because i'm crazy maverick when it comes to the magic and that is to actually think hmm everything is alive and what does that mean well that kind of means to a certain extent that everything to a certain extent has some kind of sentience doesn't it but is it something that we as humans and people would recognize as sentience now, we see a lot of these hippies and new agers that go around hugging trees and stuff like that, talking to tree spirits and the like, okay? A couple of them I've even seen hug boulders and stuff. I am tempted to the, do the kind of, um, what is it that they do in the Harry Potter? They did it in the film, in the first one, where they levitate things. Levitate a boulder, or just make it nudge slightly so it rolls over and crushes that little new ager. But then that's why people say I'm a bad witch. Um, it is tempting. You can just picture me, can't you? Some little new age coven of people hugging boulders and feeling the energy of the boulder, and I'm there, like, pushing again, because they're like, fucking go, go. Yeah. Um, the idea that everything is alive, the everything that alive and actually if you do not realize how it is alive it is a mystery to be solved okay because we can understand oh look i've got a pet dog yes yeah, probably got a soul in it oh well i'll open that up yeah got a certain amount of sentence yeah listens to me yeah we can have a conversation even though it's not in english but we seem to understand each other understand a little bit about that as something that's alive but what about something like a herb, like rosemary, for example, because it always comes back to rosemary off witchcraft, don't it? Let's be fucking fair. We're fucking sponsored by the bitch. Um, the uh, concept of, well, everything must be alive, everything must have a spirit aspect, an energetic component to it, but also it must have some kind of sentience, perhaps. Maybe it doesn't manifest in the physical realm, but maybe it manifests somewhere else. How can I you know, find this. Maybe some of the most interesting things in existence are actually so complicated that they're crystallised down to something so unmoving and unchanging that they don't do a lot in the physical world, which is why they're boring. Hmm, things to ponder and investigate. Chapter five, two worlds and in between. Hmm, don't know why it is, but I'm kind of reading a lot of this stuff is dirty and i don't think it's supposed to be i think that's just my personality the first can be considered ordinary reality the mundane world blah 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 some magical techniques can fully work in ordinary reality like dressing a candle and making an offering or producing a petition or a sigil i do ritual work physically blah 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 yeah i'd agree with that interesting not the whole point 
Very good. Like that the author kind of talks about that. The fact that I get a candle and pour some herbs on it and that's it means that the magic happens now. You know, if I get a bunch of ingredients together to make bread, follow a recipe for making bread, and then I bake it, chances are I'm going to have some bread. Magic, not so much. There's other component parts, right? Uh, some aspects of the work are only truly visible in non-ordinary reality, like astral travel, shamanic journey, and so on and so forth. Yes, very good. Are you going to get to any good stuff here? My take on how all this sorcery stuff works, that's not me, sounds like me, sort of thing how I'd write a book, isn't it? But no, that is the author's very own words. My take on how all this sorcery stuff works is that nothing substantial happens without access to non-ordinary reality. Fascinating. I would agree with that. That's very interesting. Although the one caveat I would add, one slight thing I would add, is that as humanity's knowledge increases of the sciences and such, things that used to be considered magic are no longer considered magic. And this is something that I don't like magical practitioners to ignore. The fact that, oh, I'm a witch, cunning woman, old wise woman, old bat basically that smells badly and lives on the cottage at the end of the road, right on the edge of the forest, a bit too lonely. But anyone that's ill comes to her, she makes some sort of remedy or stuff. Nowadays would probably be seen as herbal medicine. Eh, she just made some penicillin or something, didn't she? You know, old fashioned folk medicines. Science can explain that. Back then, probably a little bit more along the lines of, oh, she's just a witch, to some crazy-ass potion. I heard her saying, where's me eye of bat, wing of... Eye of bat? Wing of bat, eye of newt, where's that? You know, which we all obviously know that such things are actually slang terms because they are what they look like. Wing of bat is not actually a bat's wing. It's herb or somewhat that kind of looks a bit like a bat's wing. But yes, this concept of, well, science and stuff, when you look at really old-fashioned spells, they generally work on, here's the secondary spell triangle, spell triangle, intention, what you want, how you want it to happen, and the energy. Second spell cap triangle that I go into and love to teach is, if you really want magic to be amazingly beautiful, like to take it to a real art form, you need to, your spell to work ideally on free areas it needs to work psychologically in the noggin yeah psychologically which all these people just say oh well it's counseling and therapy and fucking placebo effect in it fuck that i don't mind adding a bit of that into my craft don't mean it needs to be all of it done it but add a little bit into it psychological basis yeah physiological basis spells when it make me healing selves yeah healing cells work both psychologically because they want to be taking the medicine and feeling good about the medicine because it tastes oh so scrummy and lovely. Like those tinctures we're not allowed to make or prescribe in the UK because they're too yummy that people get addicted, isn't it? Um, you can ask Lady Poison about them. She still won't give me the fucking recipe. Um, the next one, physiological, obviously. It has a physiological effect on the body. Flying ointments, herbal remedies, all of these things actually do something to the body. And the third one, energetically, magically, you know, physiological, psychological, magical, energetic, yes? Good, right, we'll go into that in future detail. What's next on the old list then? Chapter six, gut and bone. There is an interesting, uh, blah, 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 blah. Is it actually gonna get to the point what this is or is there gonna be waffle? Ah, uh, right, so this is just about your gut. As long as the head is in control, I am hedging against this commitment, blah, blah, blah. So get your head in the game, basically. It's all right, it's a chapter that's only about one and a half pages long. Chapter seven, reclaiming self-power and position. Ooh, this is like what we talk about, about speaking from an authoritative sort of position, isn't it? Getting on the old throne. 
uh, acting as the ma microcosm in the great macrocosm, mirroring and such that you see in the ceremonial magics and that. This is my suggested foundational practice for new practitioners. <gasps> oh, goody, what is it? It aims to blah, 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 blah. Uh, a claiming of space as a sovereign being. Okay, I agree with that. Let's just let's just breathe over that because yeah, that's just about establishing yourself as being a badass witch. Oh, here we go. The above world, the underworld, and then the four elements. That is the six ways by the looks of it, because the cover of the book has these little directional arrows, and here is just splitting up so it's explaining how this author and person sees the universe the six ways is chapter eight eight is my favorite number if you didn't know the six ways is a name for a particular map of reality it is complex enough to be useful while simple enough to allow changes to occur organically without disruption to the world right very interesting so this is their concept and this map and how they view and you know comprise their basic practice i use the capitalistic true of life because i like that it's quite cool and again it is simple yet yet complex this person uses this six ways thing which looks a little bit like a compass kind of thing um but i tell you what i'm not going to give you their secrets you're going to have to go and buy a book because otherwise that would be spilling the beans that i can't be bothered to read the entire chapter but so far is good they're putting down some kind of practice because in a magical beginner book on witchcraft and magic there is only one thing the author needs to do is to give them the reader the beginner an ability to be able to have stepping stones to to progress further on their own right if you're left at the end of a book thinking well, what do i do now that's fucking not good enough this is literally a beginner book is supposed to teach you this is how you can this is what a train is this is the train timetable this is the ticket office this is the various maps of all the places the train goes and this is how you catch a fucking train okay and then you go go on catch a train then and then catch it somewhere else you know what you don't do you know you're teaching them how it works so, you know you're teaching them the basics in order for them to have an understanding a world view um a mapping system that they can then improve you're not supposed to be teaching them everything so that they memorize it and regurgitate it which unfortunately a lot of books tend to deal with well as teachers in person copy and paste shit isn't it copy and paste it does not just mean i copied a scott cunningham book and regurgitated it copy and paste also means do what I just did and you'll be fine. Bad. That's a no-no from Liam. Oh, chapter nine, entering into silence. What can that possibly be? Ideally, I'd like to think it's that kind of um, dare to know and then keep silent and all that shit. But in reality, there are three main pieces of work or skills that are foundational to the practice of magic as I practice it. Work is what you do, your actual actions. Magic is based on work, blah, 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 blah. Uh, like it or not, healthy or not, free of pain or not, we are living in and therefore working our magic through our bodies. Very true, yeah. I've noticed that also. Um, to get a handle on our psychic selves, mind, soul, spirit, we have to do so through the medium of our body. This entails learning to relax. Oh no, it's not talking about breathing and shit. Yes, breathing work. Ah, so now I see why they call it entering into silence. So it goes on to meditation and breathing work and all that shit. Meditation and breathing work, extremely important. Okay, it is important, quite a foundational thing. Okay, however, do you know what I'm gonna say? Liam's probably gonna say, but he doesn't do it himself. Um, which is not necessarily true because I do breathe and work and stuff, kind of, um, meditations and stuff, kind of. What I was going to say is that 
When was the last time you did someone else's meditation, guided meditations and stuff or breathing exercises? And did you find it helpful? Because the majority of the time, when I see these meditation CD-ROMs, I'm actually showing my age now, meditation audio podcasts and shit on YouTube and that, I can't stand it. I don't want to memorise some fucking energy rising and falling. I don't want to do that. I can't sit still, right? Not very fucking helpful. Meditations and how we interact with and sense things, I think is extremely and extremely important, but also extremely fucking extremely unique to ourselves. And the very beginner books, at the very beginning of the beginner books and courses and stuff, is all about this meditation stuff, which I find loses a lot of people very fucking quickly because they cannot do it, because they don't do it the way the author does it in their mind. And the author is trying to make them do it in a way that isn't natural for the person. So I say, throw that all shit out. Start concentrating on spell casting. Chapter 10, entering into trance. Ooh, entering into trance. Becoming aware of the other world, you know. The available and traditional methods range from drugs and sensory deprivation deprivation to exhaustion, pain, sex. Pain, sex? Oh no, it's all right. I put a little, little dash there. So it's pain or sex or painful sex. Breath control, meditation, fasting, music, chants. Okay, so in the way me and Chris normally teach people with develop psychic ability and stuff, we don't normally go for the old fashioned approach of running around until you're dizzy and falling over or taking a shitload of drugs or causing a super immense amount of pain. I don't personally use those practices myself and I find them extremely fucking inconvenient. Okay, I don't want to have to be doing these long drawn out kind of rituals and stuff for a psychic impressions. No, I don't like that. Are there a huge amount of thousands upon thousands of years worth of history and all these things? Yes. Do they work? Yes. A lot of these do work. Are they dangerous? Yes. Some of them are incredibly dangerous. Do I do them? No, I don't do fucking any of them. Um, do we teach them? Well, no, we don't fucking teach any of them for the simple reason. There's too much of a fucking pain in the ass. I'm sorry. There's easier ways. Magic hasn't moved on now. And although there are many traditional covens and groups and magical practitioners and stuff that use very old-fashioned ways of doing stuff, I tend to like to opt for the movie kind of approach where, you know, you just like, I'm going to concentrate. Oh, look, there we go. I've done it. The spells are cast. I would click my fingers and do it, but there's a little secret that you didn't know about Liam. I've never been able to click my fingers. Yes. And clicking fingers freaks me the fuck out. Why? I don't know. I don't like it when other people do it, and I don't want to be able to do it myself. Ugh. Yuck. If anyone has any questions, by the way, we have about 20 minutes left, so I'm pretty sure that you can write in the little comments any questions regarding this book, which I have not read. I'm reading it for the first time now. Oh, look, it gives lots of meditation mantras and stuff like that. And that's a lovely picture of the old Ouroboros, Kundalini rising, meditation-y shit that you see. Yeah, not my cup of tea. Chapter 11, 11. Entering into power. This practice is easiest to perform sitting upright. Oh, that's quite convenient. So you should now be somewhat zoned out and very quiet inside. This wouldn't be a very good uh, YouTube video podcast video casting if I was not talking with it. So I, I'm going to ignore that bit. I'm going to see if I can adapt whatever this person said. Become aware that there is a pattern of energy orbiting inside your body. It is like a loop that starts at the root chakra, rises up. Oh, for fuck's sake, chakra shit. Yeah, it's going to be bastardized meditation in it. Carry on. Yeah, it's still basically the, one of these things. You know, if I was to sit down and they start talking about chakras and energy rising and falling, I'd be like, I fucking can't stand this. Why did I ever come to this class? I wouldn't be able to focus. 
fire snakes sounds more exciting than it is. This practice is easier to perform sitting down or standing. So is it easier to perform sitting down or standing? Right, okay. Um, I suppose don't do it lying down or the fire snakes will get you. I don't fucking know. I'm not going to even bother with it. Come on, let's get to the good stuff. Chapter 12, trance and travelling. There's something about a tree here. This is going into kind of, or oh, it literally just says the watchtower. Yeah, this is a very specific kind of take you on a meditative kind of group meditation stuff, the sort of thing I really dislike. Uh, anything else? Chapter 13, unlucky for some, predominantly, possibly the author of this book because it's on divination and pendulums. Unlucky because 13 is an unlucky number. People say about like crusades and shit. I don't know the history of the whole 13 thing, but there's lots of history about it. 13, do I find 13 an unlucky number? No, I fucking don't. Do I take advantage of other people that think 13 is an unlucky number? Like fucking hell I do. Pendulum. Pen divination is not a major part of my work. If we are speaking of using tools, oh, this bitch clearly can do it just by closing their eyes, which I like. I know many who deal their best, do their best work through the continuous reading of cards, bones, runes and the like. This has never been my way. I tend to get most of the answers to the questions I have by less mechanical means during divination and trance. <gasps> oh, sounds somewhat stuck up like you're throwing that in our face. I know you're not author of this book, or I'm presuming that you're not, but I'm gonna say sounds very elitist, sort of thing I would say, and the sort of thing I've heard Chris say on numerous occasions. <sighs> Uh, okay, so pendulum divination. Uh, the pendulum is a good tool in that it can be fashioned on the spot, blah, 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 blah. Pendulum divination is a fucking terrible form of divination. I think that every form of divination that just gives yes or no responses and can be easily tapped into by fucking any old thing is extremely shit. I'll go right out and say it. I'll put my head above the parapet and I will say, any form of divination that does not give you more information than you asked for and can be easily co-opted like an old fucking CB radio when some other fucking kids are fucking about with their CB radio and comes and chimes in when you're talking to your mate trying to work out how the fuck you navigate around wells when it all looks the same because it's fucking valid and shit and you dip down and then the TV stops working. That is literally like the analogue shit that is known as pendulum divination. I don't like it. I think it's easy to manipulate, easy to co-opt. And out of all of the things, when it comes to Ouija boards and stuff like that, I tell you what, I have seen far more things go wrong with pendulum divination. Because pendulum divination, Ouija boards and the like are normally utilised by people that haven't developed much of a psychic impression or ability or anything like that. They ain't got a fucking clue what they're doing. I've got a fucking clue what they're talking to. And I've seen, well, I could possibly even say devils on the shoulders of people using those little divination devices, pendulums, Ouija boards and that kind of sniggering and fucking about with it. And I'm just tutting going, honestly, the person thinks they're talking to their great aunt Jemima and it's a fucking rancid little fuck. Pendulum divination. If you want to use it, go ahead and use it. But, like an old analogue CB radio, ain't the most fucking secure line there is, I'm sorry. Chapter 14. Ring power and finding a magical voice. That is not my official magical voice. Do I have a magical voice? Yes, it's kind of like my dad's voice. Sometimes it comes out, but only when things are being a naughty. Raising power here refers to generating or directing magical energy. Interesting how now you're talking about magical energy and yet before it was all about the intention. Hmm. Oh, how times change. Raising power also aids the process that leads to being able to shift the point of conception. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Um. Right, more chakra stuff. 
exercises of the voice. Last exercise on voice. One morning, decide on a word of power you would like to manifest. But do not say it aloud, not even in a whisper. Carry inside you, like you carry all of the pain and heartache from past relationships and stuff, all day, every day, in your body, somewhere near your centre. Now, it doesn't say about that bit, I added a little bit in there, so please don't think the author said that, I'm putting full disclosure on there. Um, when evening comes, you can be alone and uninterrupted, take your word, still kept quietly in the centre of your body, to the altar, sit like a candle, which you can buy from the Thoth Witchcraft Shop, doesn't say that either, insert Thoth Witchcraft Shop general advert here, um, and begin to vibrate the vowel tones, Oh, yeah, see, I'm, uh, it's not my cup of tea. I'm sorry, it's not my cup of tea. I'm going to... Okay. Oh, chapter 15, offerings. How much more time have we got? We've got about 15 minutes left, haven't we? Um, I'll take some questions. One of the questions is, so do you walk and meditate then, Liam? I'm one of those people that can sit, not cross-legged on the floor, but I can sit down and stare at a brick wall or an empty wall or a white wall and I can just go off. I'm also the sort of person that can accidentally start to actually project whilst driving along. And I do to explain that that's very, very dangerous. One should never do that. I do have a habit of doing that. Um, it's because you're travelling so quickly and going through all of these different energetic fields. I kind of get, I don't know stuck in one and yet my physical body carries on and yet I'm like oh look like that you know when you take a dog for a walk yeah and then you're walking along and all of a sudden the chain or leash is yanked and you're looking around and the dog sniffing something or taking a piss or something that's my astral body I'll be a driving along and all of a sudden I'm like am I here am I not here something's missing I've left some fucking thing behind I know and this time it wasn't my keys or my wallet or my phone because the keys are in the ignition my wallet is listening to the no holds barred witchcraft podcast of course and I feel my wallet in my pocket I should have taken it out of my back pocket and put it in my side pocket but I didn't and now I've got a sufferer feeling it um so do I walk and meditate, Liam? Yes, I'm perfectly happy to go and do meditation. I tend to find that I work well with active meditation and also inactive meditation. What I dislike is having to meditate on something I'm told to meditate on. That I don't like, fuck all. I don't, ugh, yuck, no. Mantra, blah, that's what I think, and don't do them. Well, there we go. We're very similar to them. What's your favourite form of divination, Liam? My favourite form of divination has probably got to do with seeing the future. I do love foresight and reading the future. It's one of the first things I ever used to do without putting a huge amount of effort into it and it freaking people out. So for me, it's about dawdling into the future, forms of divination, through glimpses and seeing, seeing little bits. Um, not, not really like movies, so you kind of have the idea of premonitions, like that old TV show, Charmed, where she goes, <gasps> like that, and sees something that's going to happen, and it's all in kind of like an etheric filter, because they've put on it, because they need to distinguish between the present day, and what's happening, and the thing where it's all like a cloudy outside and all that kind of stuff that's basically kind of what a lot of it's like for me to be very similar to that i don't get that thing i just kind of disappear and i'm seeing something else normally it's something relevant focuses on something and then i kind of come back and then i have the decision that i have to weigh up and think do i write this down in my fucking notebook and go back and look at this or do i back and have a little look now a lot of the time, I just fucking ignore it, if I'm honest with you, because I've got better things to do. Um, so, yeah, looking into the future by future gazing. Um, without 
put in any effort into going to a specific place. I find that I get carried there easily. Um, if I decide to think about something specific, so if I was to think about something like war, then I would see a lot of... There was this show, I, now we've gone off on a fucking side now, haven't we? And I can't remember what the show is, and it's really going to fucking piss me off. There was a show, I think it was called Zap. Um, people from the 90s. Yeah, it was called Zap. So Z-Z-Z-A-P. You can Google Zap, okay? And there was this thing where it was basically like all of these windows, right? And it kind of zooms in and it looks like it's going into one window and then it goes off to another and there's icons on these windows. I, I, I do genuinely think that you should go on YouTube and look a uh, kids TV show or TV series, Zap, Z-Z-Z-A-P. And it's, it's just fucking weird. I'm not going to lie, it's fucking weird. But that is a lot like my psychic uh, little impressions that I get. I kind of see all of these things and it's kind of like, oh, that looks like it's going to happen somewhat soon. I can see because that fucker there is still president. Um, but yeah, there we go. So uh, what other questions is there? Uh, Favourite divination or have you interfered with the I? I. I have interfered with divination I'm not going to talk about because I don't know who's listening. When you actually project while driving, are you still aware that you're driving, like your physical body is just in the background? Very interesting question. Very good question. Love that question. What tends to happen is that I, because I have a very busy mind, when something in the room or wherever I am changes, I'm instantly pulled back in. So. I literally will go and drive somewhere. I used to do a lot of driving when I was an electrician. I used to do about seven to eight hours worth of driving a day. Um, and I will literally just like the sat nav will do something or I'll get to something and something will change. And I'll be like, I don't even fucking know how I've got here, right? I just go on autopilot. Same with anything, really. At the gym, I'm very much like that. At the gym, I can be doing stuff and not really putting a huge amount of particular, well, cardio stuff anyway. I'm with resistance training there's a lot of counting involved with that and I find numbers really difficult so I have to put a lot of effort into counting one two three four five yeah you know what counting is um so for me changes in environment are a big trigger so I can drift off astrally project glimpses whatever but as soon as there's a change in the environment I'm literally like whiplash right back there okay but the same is also true on a psychic level so I could be interacting in the room and talking to someone and all of a sudden the atmosphere and something will change in the room, okay? The problem is it's not normally in the room because it would be physical, but it will be something that is connected to the room. So stereotypically, a lot of psychics will pick up, pick up on energy that's attached to the physical surroundings, but I might not necessarily do that. It could be on various different dimensional levels of things that are tied to that room sometimes it's people sometimes it's objects it gets quite complicated but ideally it's changes when someone sometimes there's occasionally someone's talking a bunch of people are talking i'm listening and someone makes a decision about something in their mind and an outcome's big enough i see oh okay here we go because their future has changed okay I probably would need to go onto that in a little bit more detail at Future Paint because it's really fucking difficult to talk about. Um, and we're supposed to be talking about the book. When you actually project while driving, are you still aware that you're driving? Like your physical body is just in the background. No, I'm not. I'm not physically where I'm driving because it is, again, it's like an autopilot thing. So it's, it's sensations. And I, it's really difficult because obviously you just do it kind of intuitively. But when I drive, if I if there's something that came in front of me, like on the motorway, it's prime. <laughs> I should say this. Motorway is the prime time to do this kind of thing. Um, if there's a change where there's a lane needed changing, or I've got a sat nav that comes up on the dashboard and like 
does stuff and makes noises and shit and that's like jerks me back into like attention if a car pulls out in front of you with the distance of a car in front is it changed so if it goes too far ahead or gets too close i'm kind of like back into it but it's a very light trance state okay so it's more of an alpha state now the difference is is that a lot of people with the alpha state are used to just doing impressions and basic psychic level because i've done quite a lot of astral work working through the astral that that bit in between the stop gap that we would consider to be like an alpha brain state the brain state that we're normally in like we're in now because we're talking and then the astral state over here this stop gap is kind of that bits one of the bits is gone so it's very easy for me to just loop in a little bit further into astral stuff if you're stood in a porch right on a house that doesn't have a front door when are you outside okay if you've got a porch where there's the inside door and the outside door i do that the other way around inside the house front door porch door this little bit in between if that door on the outside is missing, there is a shelter, but are you outside or are you inside? It's difficult. For most people, it's very clear you're still inside because there's that door there. That door is kind of gone for me at this point. Um, there's a lot of talk about driving and stuff like that, isn't there? You seem to find psychic driving interesting. Uh, it's a thing and the car breaks by itself. This is also very true. On my car, there's this thing that actually if something happens, the little thing lights up. If you go in a different lane, I've noticed this. Never done this by accident. It's always been one I've not wanted to do it. It goes along and it's got lane guidance and stuff. And if the, if the car thinks, oh, you're going outside of this lane because I actually want to go that way, um, it'll be like, no, you fucking don't. And it takes the steering wheel and actually forces it in your hands to move. Also, the distancing, because there's little cameras in the front of the vehicle and stuff like that, so it actually tells you. Um, we have literally like one minute left, so I wonder if Mr. Chris is here. Mr. Chris, are you there? Hello, Mr. Chris. Is there anything you'd like to add about this Six Ways book, which I'm sure you've read? No. No. You are losing the plot, though. It has been interesting to watch for the last 30 minutes. Well, Chapter 16 is for the dead. Not about the dead, it's for the dead. We are all born of someone, this is, be they saints or sadists, or somewhere in between, we are links in a long, long chain of lives, because blood is life's Chris. But is it going to give me some information about working with the dead enough? I'm presuming not, because this, this chapter 16 is again a five book, a page and a half ending in practically i suggest including the dead in your magical practice but with no fucking idea as to how um i suppose you making an altar or something chapter 17 petitions we all know what we feel about petitions don't we um chapter 18 sigils servitors and spirits blah 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 overall this book might be good for a beginner but I would say if you've read three books on witchcraft or magic, I don't see much point in reading this book because the chances are, although it might be a good book for a beginner, it will be stuff you've kind of read before. If you get what I mean. I think that's a good thing. It does mention psychedelics and Star Trek in the one line in this book. I know that because my mind was drawn to that. Does that make any sense? Does that matter? No, it doesn't. Um, so I wonder what other chapters there are. At the crossroads, a brief note on roles. Oh, this could be interesting. We are spirits. We are presently embodied. But this does not change the fact, as we work in particular types or forms of magic, we become a bit like that which we work with. Which, you know, most people say you're the sum total of the five people that you hang around with. I think that it's the same for spirits and such. And energies that you work with, you know. I know someone that used to work in an abattoir and they stank. Guess what they stank of? Yeah, stank of rotten carcasses and such. Fisher people work a lot with fish and they stink of fish, you know. It retains in your energetic films. 
the stacking of skulls. So chapter 21, I'll make this the last one. On the stacking of skulls. I don't know what this is about, but it sounds like a really good chapter. In a magical sense, an altar can be and is many things. It can be a table, shelf, blah, 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 blah. Here are a few concepts that might be of interest to those who are new to this altar building thing. I tend to view the altar as a type of organic machine or device, a collection of parts that work together as a whole to perform or aid in, blah, 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 a particular task or series of tasks. Interesting. I don't think that's too dissimilar from what we talk about sometimes. Um, yes, my ultra has a lot of natural items, blah, 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 blah. My symbol set tends to towards sigils and my aesthetic tends to blah, blah, blah. Interesting. Material bases. One of the easiest ways to improve the manifestation of tangible results in magic is to incorporate a material base. A material base is any solid object consecrated or made special to a task, intention or spirit. By creating a link in the world of hard goods, physical world I'm presuming, as we can send a clear message to all parties concerned, Make this real in this material world that my body inhabits. Interesting. What's your thought on that? We talk about it a lot, believe it or not. We talk about having a physical foundation in this, this reality when you start out because it's important. Um, that you know where the physical link is to the astral or energetic link. It's called representational magic. Yeah, so I think with a lot of spellcasting workshops and when we teach beginners, we start off with the idea of they're used to the physical world, use physical ingredients that can help with spellcasting and stuff like that, do have some energetic uses, and work in the physical and the etheric, both of the realms. I think as you progress, what you tend to say is they just get rid of the physical. Just do the snapping of the fingers, just do the astral work in that, and don't bother with a lot of the physical stuff. Does that mean that everyone who just does physical work is not an advanced practitioner or intermediate or anything? No, because it's your practice and you do things how you want to do one. You know, you do it how you want to do it. But from a beginner's perspective, I think, let's be fair, if they cannot astrally project, chances are kind of pointless making them do stuff in the astral world. Get them to do stuff in the physical world and then start to get used to sensing the energies that surround those objects, ingredients and things. And then when they can do that and they can get to the other etheric worlds and such, they can just do the work there and then they don't need to do it in the physical world if they do not want to. Um, right. I think that's it then. Is that it, Mr. Chris? I think so. Okay. Well, we'll just leave them with this. 